Okay, we welcome our guests. Um, we are recording this. Thank you for joining us. My name is Doug Wilkes. I'm the executive editor of the Deseret News based in Salt Lake City. Um, I'm happy to be with you. Um, our panel is uh, um, Lee in New York. Um, but I would like to introduce our topic and then introduce our guests and we'll get going for these next 45 minutes. We're talking today about uh, short termism as a major barrier for businesses attempting to transition to more inclusive growth. And now uh, shock of COVID, we're just literally two years through COVID and the closure of Russian uh, sources for resources. There is a chance we believe to undertake this massive reorientation. So the question we're trying to answer is how can business leaders proceed with this task and how can business governments and international organizations uh, cooperate to create a better, more inclusive and trustworthy world. So that opportunity to go worldwide. We have a distinguished panel today who's very experienced in this matter. Uh, may I present Munir Akram. He is chairman of the Group of 77 at the United Nations. The Group of 77, of course, is a coalition of 134 developing countries designed to promote its members' collective economic interests. So we're hoping, Mr. Ekram, that you have the key to this topic for 134 countries. That will be the measuring stick today. Uh, we have Xavier Michon, Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations Capital Development Fund. Um, he was appointed as Deputy Executive Director of the De Development Fund in 2014. And he plays a critical role to support the Executive Director in providing leadership and shaping the vision, the, st the strategy, really, of the organization. And also today we have Barbara Prey, who's a, a very accomplished artist. Um, her, um, her contemporary work was recently commissioned by a, a mass uh, MOCA. What's MOCA, Barbara? Um, Museum, Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art. <laughs> um, she's painted the largest known watercolor painting um, and her art resides in the National Gallery of Art, the Brooklyn Museum, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Uh, Kennedy Space Center and the permanent collection of the White House. If we do nothing else today, we need to be uh, mind that art and, and go search far and wide. She's also served for the past 12 years as the sole uh, visual artist on the U.S. President appointed National Council of the Arts as the advisory board to the National Endowment of the Arts. Uh, we may also be joined by others, but we will, we will start there. And so, Mr. Akram, I'd like to start with you, each of you, to kind of respond to our general question which is given that we're in this place at this moment in time, can we truly um, overcome short-termism short and provide more opportunity, more inclusivity for others? Mr. Akram. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Thank you for having me on, on, on this panel. Uh, I think we, we all know uh, the, the triple global crisis we're facing, COVID, uh, are we facing a climate uh, crisis and at the same time a development crisis um, as a result of, of the two others. On top of this, now we have Ukraine sanctions, which will have an impact also on the developing countries. Uh, the, the, the COVID crisis has exposed the inequities in the financial and uh, and, and trade system. Uh, mobilization of resources, $17 trillion have been injected as financial stimulus by the richer countries. The developing countries have been able to mo mobilize additional resources of around $100 billion if, 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 if that as such. Now we're facing, because of supply chain disruptions, as well as the uh, money floating in the market, uh, inflationary cycle, which is going to lead to interest rate uh, uh, rises, and which will uh, compound the payments difficulties of the developing countries. So what is the answer? And, and here I agree with the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, who said, we need a complete overhaul of the global financial system which has led to skyrocketing inequalities within and among countries, unbearable levels of debt of developing countries, and unbridled, illicit financial flows. So what can we do? I would say that we start 
with the issue of trying to resolve the debt burden, the debt problem that is going to affect about countries, about 40 of them are, are in distress. We, we should extend the uh, debt suspension of the G20 for another year or two. Uh, we should speed up the application of the common framework, which they have agreed, but which is applied in, in a very slow way. It must be speeded up so that countries can get uh, relief as soon as, as soon as possible. And we must get the private sector to participate in the debt restructuring, which they have not done so far. Secondly, there is a lot of money even in the financial system which is available with the IMF. The IMF has $650 billion uh, uh, in SDRs, in new SDRs that have been created. About $400 billion of these SDRs are not going to be utilized because the rich countries don't need them. Uh, we believe that it would be important that a sizable part at least half of these unutilized SDRs should be allocated to developing countries uh, to enable their recovery. The multilateral development banks should be refinanced as they were after the financial crisis because they can raise a multiple of uh, at least four times the money that they are recapitalized at in order to be able to support uh, the developing countries. Uh, there are also innovative proposals, such as the creation of a repo facility for developing countries. Uh, this has been proposed by the Economic Commission for Africa, uh, but it needs a, a guarantee system from one or two major central banks in order to become operational. Uh, and, of course, there is, there is the question of the transition. This is recovery, but we have to turn transition to a sustainable and green global economy. To do that, uh, huge investments are required. It's estimated that in order to achieve net zero by 2050, uh, we will need to invest by about $100 trillion, and particularly into sustainable infrastructure. Um, we need to tap the private markets for this money. It is not available anywhere else. Size of the resources required not available in pub with public money, so we'll have to tap the private markets. How do we do that? Developing countries uh, do not have access to the private markets primarily because they are unable to formulate bankable projects for financing from the, the capital markets. We need to help developing countries uh, to formulate and develop a large pipeline of sustainable development projects in order to be able to access uh, the, the finances. And then, of course, uh, there, there is the issue of the illicit financial flows. Billions, hundreds of billions of dollars flow out of developing countries because of criminal behavior, uh, tax fraud, and tax evasion. And this includes taxation on the digital economy, digital commerce, uh, which, uh, which is a new area that needs to be dealt with. Uh, the OECD agreement on, on uh, a minimum corporate tax does not answer all the questions uh, with regard to financial, illicit financial flows. There are 14 recommendations from what is called the Financial Account Accountability Task Force, the FACTI panel, and these are worth looking at uh, in order to see how we can stop the bleeding of resources from developing countries and enable them to mobilize domestically a large part of their recovery and transition to a sustainable system. So these are a few ideas in response to, to your question. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Michon, uh, kind of the same approach. How do we create a more inclusive society coming off of these past two years? Well, thank you for the question. So let me start. I'm a development practitioner. So by definition, I see the glass half full and not half empty. And, uh, and by definition also, I look at 
I, I try to combine the, the medium long term with the with the let's say the the, the short term. Uh, I, I don't want to be prescriptive in, in in my recommendations. Maybe we talk about a couple of things based also on my experience, uh, which uh, yeah, living in in OECD countries in the developing world where I spent most of my career uh, in in several continents. I think we have to look at always what's positive, what's also what is what can build upon, uh, can be built on and, and, and tapped into. And, and, and I think that's something that also bring different parcels around. Uh, when I look at the countries that we're talking about, we see a youth that is emerging. I mean, in the, the, you look at the pyramid, the age pyramid, you, you have an amazing youth that can be a force of good, that can be a force of a creativity, that can be contributing to the economy. To, of course, to society, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's an opportunity that cannot be uh, forgotten and has to be invested in. Uh, let me highlight that this is also a youth. This is not when I was born. There was no internet. And i just give you an example. I was stationed in one of the poorest countries in, uh, in, in the world before this assignment. And uh, I had my iPhone uh, fixed by someone in the market, a young uh, teenager, and he learned everything by um, uh, YouTube that did not exist. This is today a youth that is connected, that is learning, that is getting models, that is acquiring knowledge that, you know, thanks to digital is, is providing them opportunities that at least I did not have. And, and I think that that's something that we should consider that. Um, two, the, the, that connectivity is, in my opinion, extremely important. Digitization is, is uh, something that we should uh, discuss even further. And uh, Ambassador Akram mentioned it, and maybe going in the lines that also the, the, the ambassador mentioned, I think today, when we're talking about those markets today, you have on one side, uh, you have clients that today are asking for inclusivity. They're asking for um, uh, social standards, environmental standards in investment. You have today a young generator, whether it's millennials or others, that are saying, I want to have a return on my investment, but I also want to have a return in terms of basically doing good. And that's, I can tell you, I have a CEO that told that, uh, by the way, on one of these big Wall Street said, and redefine basically my, uh, my marketing, also my engagement, because my client are asking to do so. So that we have that on the north. But we also have, I think, a problem of communication in the sense that today certain markets are more characterized by perceptions. They're characterized by uh, let's say cliches uh, when I think those markets and in developed countries have amazing opportunities. Having seen that myself, I can tell you that those that are smart, that they know that you know uh, you cannot just doing business having a Bloomberg, a Bloomberg screen and getting all the numbers, crunching numbers, and then doing a, a, a transfer electronically. I think it's the other way of doing business. It's being present, being connecting. And if you do that, and you try to understand the culture, you try to connect and not just landing into the, uh, the main hotel of, of, uh, of that country and spending three days and leaving and making your investment decision. I think the opportunities that can be made. So maybe to give you one thing that we're trying to do at UNCDF, of course, we work on investments. We're trying to use those investments as, as study cases, as also elements that can be proofs of concept that you know we can blend financing from different sources with different risk aversions with different instruments and they yield positive impact in society in the environment of course uh, they improve the incomes they engage more the women etc cetera, etc cetera. and of course uh, they 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 yield also good returns but another role that i think which is very important is to try to connect spaces where basically investors can talk to entrepreneurs and we do believe that basically uh, and so I'm talking about entrepreneurs in developing economies that they don't know where to go. Uh, they don't know who to talk to. Uh, let's not forget that entrepreneurs, when you talk to an investor, you have to speak a certain language. Someone told me one day, an entrepreneur's not, uh, what was the expression? Yes, they, know, they have to know how to dress to the party. And there's a certain code, there's a certain language. So I think there are some elements that we can do on that side. Also, the investors, they think also a certain way that, you know, is more standardized. I think when you're talking about developing countries, you have to be a little bit more flexible, a little bit creative. And we do believe that we need to start connecting those dots. So actually, uh, in, in the next few days, we will be launching uh, some kind of a Tinder platform whereby basically investors can start connecting with entrepreneurs 
Uh, we're using uh, algorithms to uh, assess those companies that provide us this information, and we want to start an informed conversation. What we want is that spark that leads to a conversation that then goes in, uh, uh, let's say, on a bilateral basis, and hopefully start connecting those dots. We think that those marketplaces do not exist, uh, at least the way we think about it, and we think that the UN, because it has its neutrality, because it has its convenient power, we can create spaces where we can combine a digital platform, where we can leverage also our presence on the ground to motivate basically that ecosystem of entrepreneurs and also motivate, of course, the different investors from different latitudes. And just to let you know, today uh, we have done like Apple and I'll stop there, that, you know, they present their products before selling them. We have done exactly the same thing. The product is about to be launched, but we started talking about it about, uh, I would say, six months ago. And we have about 25 entities, multinationals, development banks, uh, business associations, employer associations that already said we're in. We do believe that that's a space and we want to create exactly those uh, connections to reduce those gaps in terms of perceptions, in terms of information, but also connecting those two worlds that still need to, 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 to talk. And that's something that will be a contribution uh, that could be helpful and also break certain silos and, and, and connect those two worlds that, you know, for certain, to a certain extent, are not talking as they should. Again, I'm referring to uh, to, uh, to developing markets, and in particular, the least developed countries, which, as you know, are defined as frontier markets. So they're not even the emerging markets that we all know, the Kenyas, the Nigerias, where they're overcrowded. These are markets that today uh, still merit certain attention. And we do believe the tremendous opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Michon. And I might say to those listening to this, um, to reach out uh, to Xavier for more on that network, because that sounds wonderful when you launch that. Let's go to um, Ms. Frank. Um, art can often bridge cultures and worlds. What's your take on this situation of how we uh, get more inclusive? I definitely bring a different perspective. Um, you know, artists are creative. They take, take risks, risks and they come up with new ideas. They're also entrepreneurs, which Xavier um, was talking about. And I think that business leaders can learn from artists and creatives to help them think outside the box. Um, it's also, you know, engaging with the arts is beneficial to creative thinking in the business world. And I'll, I'll just throw out an example. Um, you, you had mentioned I was um, commissioned by Mass Mocha to paint the largest watercolor for their new, new building. And the director shared with me, and this was during COVID when things were really tough for museums, um, that when things were tough or overwhelming, she'd just go down, sit in front of my painting and just look at it. And it really helped her to focus and problem solve. So that's a little piece, but it's a, you know, it's, it's something that, um, you know, is, is very helpful in the, in the creative process. Um, artists also are often looking at trends as well as creating and leading the trends. So being aware of and responding to the trends, but also leading has important implications for business leaders and it applies to technology as well. Um, I particularly saw during the pandemic, some of the suppliers I work with sadly closed their businesses. So I, I, I get to work on a very small, kind of a microcosm of the bigger world. Um, musicians, actors lost their audience and museums shut down. They all had to reinvent. Um, I can also say this as I voted on various grants that went to support many of the organizations through COVID, um, through the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, and you know, maybe I should stop there. I was going to talk, go, go on about corp, um, cooperation. So I've been involved with the national, uh, for the, the United States, um, department of art and embassies program, and they place, um, American artists work in the different embassies abroad. Um, and that uh, I've spearheaded a couple of programs through there. I've been in, uh, fan, sorry, France, Spain, the Czech Republic, and Norway. But it's a form of soft diplomacy and um, countries, people coming and working together. Um, I have some other things I can discuss, but I'll, uh, actually, I think I'll go on to, this is the larger question, is um, I think the world's largest corporations are going to play an increasingly leadership role in corporate social responsibility, which actually um, Xavier had just touched on. Um, DEI, just capitalism and sustainability, and we could see the corporates, not the governments, working in unison to make forward strides. Um, it's increasingly going to be creating a richer and deeper, more authentic corporate culture. Um, and 
it also makes it, and again, going back to Xavier, it makes it have an ability to track the younger generation, which will then inspire and retain um, staff. I'm, you might ask this, I think a threat would be cyber attacks, um, which will do an incredible damage to business, the markets and everyday life. But I can um, let my colleagues who are very knowledgeable speak about that. Well, let me do this. It's interesting. Um, the three of you kind of um, grabbed a hold of a concept, which is, um, Mr. Akram, you talked about the need for green investment, you know, talking about corporate social responsibility, and then um, Xavier talking about the youth and capturing. That seems to be an intersection where there might be opportunity. Uh, so, Mr. Akram, have you, have you seen in, in all the countries that you deal with, have you seen examples of success where they've been able to innovate and become more green or capture a unique answer, innovate? Well, I, I think there are many success stories in the developing world, and I'm sure that uh, Xavier would, would be more, uh, more familiar with them, having dealt with on the, on the ground level. But there are success stories. Costa Rica, for example, is, is, is a uh, success story as far as sustainable development models are concerned. Um, and, and those models can be scaled up and emulated. The, but, you know, my central point is that there is a, there is a gap, a, and the gap is mainly a financial gap. Uh, and, and everything comes back to the, the question of availability of resources for investment. Uh, and of course, we we are all, you know, un, in the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals. We we have the targets, we have the policies for sustainable development, responsible development. But our problem, the problem is, at least as far as the poorer countries are concerned, is a huge um, inability to access money, to access resources. Um, their own resources uh, are not are insufficient, as we have seen, uh, and therefore we've got to create mechanisms which will provide them with access to money. And and some of the ideas that, that we put forward these these are issues on which we are, which we are pursuing in the in the context of the policy discussions at the UN. Uh, but we will need to do some of these things if we are going to keep the global economy only growing, but growing on a more equal and equitable basis. Because I think if two thirds of the world, world's people fall behind, which is what is happening, uh, the global economy is diverging uh, in the, in the post pandemic uh, world. Uh, richer countries have been able to recover. Uh, the poorer countries, most of them are, are, you know, are either flat or they're going down. Uh, so this divergence, I think, is what we need to address. Because if you have um, growing inequality, all the pressures that we're facing, migration, conflict, uh, environmental degradation, all of those consequences will be exacerbated, will multiply. So in order to create stability in the world, in order to sustain the global economic system itself, I think we need to address urgently the problem of equity. And, and that's what the Secretary General, by the way, has been, has been insisting on uh, in, in the past, uh, past couple of years. So if we go, uh, Mr. Michon, this issue of equity and this issue of access to money, do you see solutions there coming out of COVID where we can tie people closer together? Um... So let me start with one thing. Uh, I think we have to change the narrative. When, to, when I go to, to conversations about investing in developing economies, it's always the word challenges that appears. And I think we have to change the narrative to opportunities. That's one. Then we, it, the, 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 the conversation also very short term oriented. It's maximizing profit over the short term. I think that we have to generate an awareness. And I think there are many. Uh, entrepreneurs that have that vision, that have that understanding that basically the GDP creation over the next 20, 30 years is not going to come for the usual suspects. 
and there are countries from the south that today are going to leave the way. So you better be present in those markets. And Africa is a market that needs to be uh, tapped into, and you need to be present today to connect with those markets. I'm saying Africa like I would say any other market. But those markets, you need to start connecting with them. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, there's a lack of understanding that there's not an African market, for example. There are more than 50 African markets. They with one with the, the idiosyncrasies, the cultural approaches. And I think I understand that there is a movement towards, let's say, simplifying and, 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 and trying to, to uh, develop broader, let's say, market structures in, in, in the African continent, like in others. But there has to be an understanding that today you need to lay those foundations, you need to connect with those markets to be present there. That's one. And there are tremendous opportunities in terms of growth. The rates of return that you can get in those markets are not what you get in northern countries that are oversaturated. Uh, and, and basically, I think it's very difficult to spot. Second point, in terms of creativity, look at the tech industry, whether it's Aquitech, uh, FinTech, uh, Insurance Tech. Look at what is being produced in those economies. When I'm talking about youth, it's not a youth that is not trained. Actually, it's a youth that is extremely aggressive as an entrepreneur, I'm saying, in the positive sense of the world, that is, that has capacities, and basically mastering the digital divide is not something that, you know, is not open to anyone. Basically, people are learning that via digital platforms. So what you see today are pools of creativity, pools of entrepreneurship that are coming from different angles of the world uh, that are not the usual, let's say, markets of the North. And I believe that for those who uh, are understanding that, that they need to have that approach, with, uh, which is a little bit, let's say, with a perspective of medium to long term, I think it can it can pay off. These are this is one one for me one something. So uh, so I'm 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 emphasizing the opportunity element. I'm kind of uh, I would say bullish about those uh, the, 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 the 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 developing economies and most of them, and I do believe there are opportunities that are not tapped into. And so that's where we come in that we can connect. Uh, public, private, where we can blend different forms of capital with different, uh, let's say, structures, with different timings. We, we basically, from our side, we support entrepreneurship. And the first thing we do, apart from resources, we give confidence. The only thing, the, only, the first message that we give to our entrepreneurs is because we come with you, you're doing something right. We're supporting you technically. We believe in you. And I think that that vote of confidence is priceless. In addition, there's financing, and it comes through different, let's say, through different forms, from uh, technical assistance, accompanying um, grants. Then, when that model generates a revenue that is more stable, we will look at concessional financing via debt. We're trying to motivate others via guarantees. But I think there is something that is is happening. We see more and more actors that today are knocking on our doors and say. We would like to experiment in those markets. We would like to understand them. And they don't see the investment per se as a way to generate a return, but it's a way to discover that market. We say via that investment, I'm going to know that ecosystem, whether it's the sector of fisheries, sector of uh, a, a, a subsector in the agricultural. And we see that more and more actors are coming and they come also with that lens. We want to find the next investment opportunities, but we do believe that the dollars that we put in there, the knowledge that we transfer through our work also is generating jobs, is empowering people, is contributing to the tax systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and has a positive result. And that's something that our customers want. So it's a win-win. And we do believe that there's something that needs to be expanded. There's more communication to be done. Uh, and I'm, just to, to stop, you wouldn't believe that today there are colleagues from the UN that are stolen by investment firms because we bring the CSR connected to the investment side. That would have never happened in the past. Imagine a UN that brings because we bring a capacity that the investment industry doesn't have. Today we have to listen from my entity it had again have done to private entities because they bring that capacity and they bring that element that today is a must and is being required by Wall Street here in the, actually it's in New York City where I lost two colleagues. So I think it's, it's a sign of things are happening. And again, I would like to highlight that with practical examples. And that's one of them. I appreciate that. You are a glass half full person. I appreciate your optimism. Ms. Prey, years ago, you were in Taiwan as a visiting professor of Western art, studying with Chinese master painters. 
did that experience being in Asia help you see how maybe you can break down barriers or are there other experiences as you've worked in the fields you've worked in that you could comment on as possible solutions? Yes, these are again kind of smaller um, experiences, but um, we're all made up of individual individual experiences. I had a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation uh, in 1986, and they send um, promising American leaders to uh, have an Asian experience because they saw Asia as a important. Um, you know, it's very important to know a lot about to know about Asia and come back and bring that into um, whatever field you're working. In. Um, I also had a Fulbright scholarship, which is, was a wonderful program. Um, so for, for what the United States does, it gives you a, a, a great way of looking at the world from different perspectives. Um, and so I've been able to live outside for maybe five years of my life and, and actually paint. I did a whole series of paintings. Um, but, you know, I'm even looking at, I, I did work for NASA. I was a NASA artist. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at this International Space Station, you know, wondering what will happen to that cooperation. But that was a wonderful cooperation of Europe um, the, uh, and um, the Soviet Union, Russia, working together with the United States. Um, so I, I think those individual experiences, um, again, you, for students are wonderful because you never know who is going to be the next leader um, mm -hmm. in those interactions. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you each, what role does education play in this? We talk about access to money, we talk about the need to connect, you know, an entrepreneur with someone. But if you're going into developing countries, do we need a different kind of education? Do we need a degree from a university? Mr. Akram, what's your experience as you've looked at that? Well, I think uh, obviously education is key uh, to, to, to be able to do all the things that uh, our friend uh, Mr. Mr. Michaud is saying. Uh, we can't achieve it without education. So you've got to have the right policies in place. And it's true that the, that the digital revolution has now made access to education uh, much, much wider. But again, I come back to, to the issue. If you're going to have connectivity, you've got to have the broadband. You've got to have the, the, the uh, cables in place. You've, you've got to have some infrastructure in order to get connectivity. The digital divide is a vast divide uh, and, and is another, um, another manifestation of the divide. So if you're going to achieve the educational revolution, which is possible today because of the digital world, we need to then invest in that form of infrastructure. So again, I come back to Creating, we need to create the foundations for these developing countries to be able to access the money. Uh, I'll just give you one figure. Uh, we have, the Secretary General has created what is called the GISD Alliance, uh, uh, with, with, uh, which is a public-private partnership uh, with the UN. And, and they see a number of projects that come from developing countries. Uh, including those, I, 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 I hope, that have been developed by the UNCDF. Uh, but, you know, so far, according to my information, there has been not a single cent invested by those 30 corporations which form that alliance. And why is that? Uh, and that is because the developing countries don't have the capacity to have projects that are bankable by Wall Street standards. Uh, so we've got to find other solutions. We've got to have better project preparation. We've got to have blended finance, as Mr. Michaud has said. Uh, we've got to have the connections between the private sector and the, and the developing countries and entrepreneurs in the developing countries. Uh, so all of that is possible. And there are exciting possibilities. The, the whole digital space, for example, is one where you can... We, where, where developing countries can leapfrog, uh, even in a, in a country like mine, in, in Pakistan. Just the last year, the largest investment we had was $400 million investment in digital startups in the IT sector. Uh, so there are possibilities. But we, as, as Mr. Michel said, we have to connect the dots. Uh, we've got to get the capacity 
to prepare projects, and we have to have the capacity to be able to present those projects and at us the right kind of money uh, in order to get, to get the investment going in the developing countries. And if we can get the investment going, everything is possible. Uh, education is possible. Uh, infrastructure is possible. Industry is possible. And the, and the opportunities, I, I totally agree with, uh, with uh, Mr. Michaud, the, opera, the huge opportunities are in the developing countries. Uh, they have the population, they, they have the population, the latent demand is there, and we have to tap that demand and train those people in order so that they can be productive in contributing to, to the growth of, the, of their country. So yes, there is hope, but we've got to get our policies back. Thank you. Mr. Michon, um, talking about entrepreneurs, sometimes they leave education because they have a good idea, connect them to money, and they go forward. From your perspective, what's your vision for education helping to bridge this divide? Well, let's start with the basics. I mean, uh, I would start with primary education. And maybe, you know, it reminds me when I was stationed in Burundi, one day I presented a picture to my staff, and it was a street. You could see people walking bicycles and uh, market maybe in the back. And in the center, there were two children. And my staff, this, taken, this picture was taken during the week at 10 a.m. What, what do you come out of it? And basically, the whole conversation was, what are these two kids doing on the street? Shouldn't they be at school? We always take for granted that primary education is free, it's compulsory, but it's, it's not a given. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, gave me also a degree of humility in all my experience in the world is electricity, access to health, uh, free education, are not given to everyone. And, and I think we need to start with those fundamentals and also... Uh, using the, the, the words of um, the ambassador, that uh, education is an investment. And when you invest in your people, it yields the results. Unfortunately, politicians are, let's say, driven by uh, the, the short-term elements of, of the cycles, of the electoral cycles. But when you invest in your people and you start investing from uh, the grassroots and the, the basis in private education, I think it yields the results. That leads to the... To the um, to the, uh, to the point on the entrepreneurs. Maybe one, one point, uh, and it's not about education, but we know that many entrepreneurs, when they're seeking capital, not everyone has done uh, business studies. All these people are in the tech, they're people that code. They have a good idea, but that doesn't mean that they know, about, they know how to talk about finance, they know how to talk about uh, how to structure basically uh, uh, an offer based on a business plan. And, uh, and, uh, and that thing, that's something, a problem of the North and on the South. Uh, in the South, you have structures, you have consultants. Uh, so we're trying to play that role. And actually, in this platform that we have developed, we are actually using an algorithm because we utilize the data provided by the company that registers. Could be a small company, a big company. It's a very simple uh, um, and accessible, um, let's say, uh, website. We, we tested it with micro enterprise in Burkina Faso. They, they provide all the information. But basically, we utilize the data, we using an algorithm, we pass it to basically a, a request for funding. So basically, what we transpose the data in a format that says, this is who I am, this is what I do, this is where I want to go, this is what I need. But in a language that is understood. Of course, it's not perfect, but it gives them a tool that they can then rework, but also think about and do an introspection that says, oh, this is how I see myself, and this is how I have to project myself, and this is how this is the tool I need to in, utilize to engage. So what we want also is to provide exactly elements to build capacity. I'm diverting a little bit from the educational side, and I think these are these complements that also bring something on top to narrow that gap between uh, capital and entrepreneurship. Okay. Um, uh, Barbara, any, any thoughts on education as it relates to the world of art or trying to bring the worlds together? I missed, I couldn't hear it. Would you repeat just, the question? Just, yes, just the role of education as it relates to trying to solve this problem or bring about more opportunity and inclusivity. I think as they both said, it's important. Um, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs don't need great education. They just need a drive and a vision. So you don't have to have uh, you know, all these degrees. You, just the desire to go ahead and do what you want to do. Of course, I'm talking, I'm talking as an artist, um, so it's a different perspective. You know, it's more of a training. 
we have about six minutes, so I'd like to give you each uh, two minutes each to kind of give us your optimistic vision of vision of the future. So, um, uh, Barbara, let's start with you um, about what's what's your final word on this topic today. Well, I had actually wanted, hoping we were going to talk about cryptocurrency and um, and cyber attacks because I think those two major um, two major uh, things that we'll be, we'll be facing in the future and um, that we need to look at carefully to, to keep us all safe. Um, but I am an optimist and I would just say, go support your museums. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Xavier? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll link education on you very quickly based on, on, on our experience. Uh, I was in Burkina where we were supporting the microfinance sector to basically engage with the youth. And engaging with youth is a component of educating the youth to utilize financial products. Again, have a saving account, borrowing money, paying interest, reporting to a bank, generating that relationship is not a given to everyone. Uh, so this educational element was embedded in addition to how the, 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 the products were priced, but we work with microcredit institutions in that sense. So the, I, when I was there, I asked to meet with some customers. And of course, I had a young group. Uh, they were all in the teens, early 20s. And I had two, they were very silent. And suddenly someone says, you came too late. I said, well, what does that mean? So one of the, the, the young clients said, you know, I discovered that by putting money on the side, I'm generating a leader interest. Then the bank is trusting me and giving me a loan. I can generate a positive cycle whereby basically I utilize that to buy tools, generate a business, et cetera, et cetera. I pay back and I go and it gives them confidence and it gives them some a perspective and gives them hope. That was the first one. So I started with that. And the second one came to me and said, you know what? We are, I mean, I feel that program finance about 8,000 clients. Uh, we were supporting, so 8,000 kids. I mean, young, young adults. Uh, but one of the, the, the clients told me, look, we want the 8,000 lucky ones. Imagine if the entire youth in our country, we know about this. Imagine if we would teach those basic elements through the educational system in our country, how, how we could unleash the potential for generating growth, unleash the potential entrepreneurship, give confidence to our youth, and bring a positive element. For me, that was a lesson learned. And that was coming from the voice of an 18-year-old and an 18-year-old uh, based on a, on a conversation that I didn't know would take to that time. For me, it was a lesson learned, and it gave me a lot of hope. Mr. Akram, a final word on the future? Well, I I think we uh, are, uh, as has been said, we are in the world at an inflection point. Uh, this is a moment where I think we either we restructure uh, our global economic uh, uh, institutions uh, or we will see chaos. Uh, I think that... Uh, there is the fundamental point, which is unless we are able to address the divergences, the inequities, both within countries as well as among countries, I think we are headed for very difficult times. In any case, our structures have to change because technology is going to force those that change. The digital revolution is, is forcing huge changes even in the financial markets and in the way that countries are, are governing themselves and developing themselves. It is completely changing structures. The power equations uh, are changing both within countries and among countries as such. So we need to find a solution and agree on a new structure that can accommodate everybody. And my, my only hope is the United Nations. I think the United Nations is underutilized. Uh, the United Nations has country offices in 125 countries. Uh, we are not fully utilizing the capabilities of these country offices to learn what these countries need, how we can, how they can be helped to to become integral part of a global economy which addresses their priority uh, concerns. So. Um, uh, I believe that we need to invest in development, but I, need, I think we need to invest in the United Nations 
as a system. Thank you. Thank you so much to my esteemed panel. Um, technology is both the solution and maybe a problem to your point, Ms. Prey, about uh, cybersecurity, certainly something for the future. We'll save that for uh, another hour. We'll come together. <laughs> um, thank you to those who are listening. Certainly reach out to these panelists who've had wonderful ideas, and uh, we'll go forward for the rest of the day. Congratulations, and thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.